all right? And so some of you have probably had, who had chicken pox? Has anyone had chicken pox in here? Yeah, I mean, it was like those numbers dwindle. Um, I'm too old for the vaccine, um, but a lot of you um, probably uh, have gotten that vaccine. Remember though, getting a vaccine for chicken pox does still not mean that you'll get, uh, you won't get shingles. And so shingles is actually an interesting vaccine that you don't get until your 50s or 60s, right? And that's typically when shingles um, crops up. It's caused by the same virus, right? Uh, these viruses travel along nerve endings. So if you've known some of shingles, um, they'll kind of have these bands and it'll be incredibly painful and sensitive in that area. And that's why. Yes, ma'am. Because it doesn't, um, it's not a, we'll say disease that typically crops up in younger people. And so they just kind of push it off. At risk for shingles, I'll be honest, Jada, I would have to look up and see what would classify someone as kind of at risk. Everybody, everybody's. Yeah, I mean, and at, at this, yeah, I'll be honest, Jada, I, I do not know because I haven't heard of, as far as I know, shingles doesn't, doesn't quite work like that. What I don't know is if like I had shingles and I was hanging out with my wife, would she get, sh I don't know if shingles works like that. So I'd, I'd have to check, that's a great question. That's a great question, all right. Um, so smallpox is, is fascinating from a historical perspective. Uh, those of you that are, uh, still have time, I think most of you are seniors are getting ready to leave me, which is sad, um, but I'm actually doing a history of disease course for the healthcare and humanities trip that goes to England in July. Fingers crossed, yay vaccines, right? Because uh, England's on a pretty like incredible lockdown right now um, because of the virus. But one of the diseases that we'll talk about in my class is smallpox. And right, we have seen right, documentation from 1200 BC, um, Egyptian origin. Um, so some of the mummies that have been um, uh, found, right, have had scarring that indicates that they likely had smallpox. Um, and what's really interesting is that Hippocrates, right, kind of the father um, of, we'll say, modern medicine, right, around 400 BC, did not actually describe smallpox. And he was a pretty thorough gentleman. And so what we really think, right, is that we had kind of an Asian African origin uh, for smallpox that eventually made its way to the Mediterranean and then to the rest uh, of Europe, right? So it appears to be just from kind of our historical documentation um, uh, originating in Africa uh, and uh, Asia, all right? And so we, we start to have some pretty big um, outbreaks in the fourth and fifth century um, in Europe in 700 um, uh, AD, right, uh, a third of the population of Japan is lost. And um, if you track kind of plagues like smallpox, right, from just using plagues uh, as a general term, uh, historically, you kind of see this interesting cycle of populations rise because people are healthy, right, doing good, right, doing what healthy people do, getting married, right, making vows, having babies, right, prosperity, and then population kind of hits a certain kind of point, and then disease hits, wipes it back down, right, and we kind of get this kind of up and down um, kind of effect uh, going on, uh, you know, throughout, throughout history, all right. So again, we see smallpox documented in a Persian medical book as early as 900 AD, right, we have a kind of major kind of plague that again Right, so from 1100 to 1600, it's not just death and despair. Again, that's where you kind of see populations rise up, kind of hit a critical point. Smallpox gets introduced, go back down, right? And smallpox is not the only, right? The actual bubonic plague, the Black Death, um, followed a similar pattern uh, throughout history. Um, from Europe, right, we then start to explore and set out to the New World, right? And so then we bring it over um, to North and South America, right? And this is one of the diseases, right, that you hear about that has decimated indigenous populations, right, um, in those different um, regions uh, of the world, okay? 
Huh? Monty Python, anybody? Okay. All right. All right. Oh, so, you know, my boy, right, Columbus. And so this is kind of one of the, again, we're not here to talk about Columbus, all right, necessarily. Um, but, right, he's kind of one of the kind of, we'll say, main culprits, right, that brings disease over. Not purposefully, um, but still. All right. Um, and so, you know, throughout the history, we estimate over 400 million deaths um, uh, for a while in Europe in the 18th century, there was 400,000 deaths a year. All right. So I am not, not diminishing the severity of um, COVID. All right. But for many reasons, a lot of them probably going to be our modern medical technology. COVID, right, compared to some of these historical plagues, um, still, right, has a lot of catching up to do, which I hope it never does, all right? Um, for smallpox, and you'll see some pictures here, maybe in a minute, hopefully if I can get to them, um, survivors are often left severely scarred. Um, you can see where these pox kind of form. You can see here a third of them are, are blind. Um, it wasn't honestly, and you, there's still people alive that have some of the scarring, especially on their face um, from smallpox, as I mentioned before, right? Aztec and Incan empires uh, were wiped out um, by smallpox, right? Uh, interactions with the conquistadors. Um, what is now Mexico City um, was, uh, I mean, the populations were huge there and it was easily taken over um, by just a few hundred soldiers. All right, because uh, the disease had decimated the area. Yes. Do you think we'll still die from smallpox in the world? Um, no. So the last, and I have it here a little bit later. Um, the last natural deaths from smallpox were in the 1970s, I believe. And then I think the last death, oh, I can check my date when we get here. I want to say 1983. And it was actually, um, the, the story is unfortunate. I'll just tell you right now. So there was a research lab that worked on smallpox and something happened with the air ventilation system. And so it was like the next floor up or something, the vent fed out on this one lady's desk. And so somehow got aerosolized, went, infected her and she died. That's the last, that's the last documented death. I guess I cannot guarantee that there's something we don't know about, but as far as documentation, yes, um, it's been a while. Uh, smallpox. Uh, from a vaccination standpoint is incredibly fascinating, right? So you have something called variolation, and this was first actually right um, uh, in around 600 AD. And so um, it reduced the fatality rate to 2%. Um, and what the Chinese would do, and I don't know if I mentioned this before, but they would take the scabs from people that had smallpox, they would grind it up and then they would snort those scabs, right? And it was kind of a primitive crude vaccination that was relatively effective. Um, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, ooh, that's quite a mouthful, right? Um, was a British royalty, and I believe she was in Persia um, and uh, picked up on a practice where you would make a small incision on the arm and then take a scab from somebody and put it into that incision, all right? Uh, interestingly enough, at this time in Europe, that became a, um, a sign of wealth and prosperity, right? Because this was not for the poor folk, right? This was for the rich folk. So if you had that scar, right, it was kind of an indication of social standing. Um, interestingly, too, we talk about medical ethics. The first people that were tested were prisoners, which, all right, after the test, they were released. Um, and then um, a couple orphans. Mm -hmm. Sorry, right? But she actually wanted to test the whole orphanage and someone talked her down to just a few of them. So, you know, so progress, right? Um, we're, we're, not testing, we're not testing orphans anymore. They put the scar from someone that has it. So they, the, the, or the scab, I'm sorry, not the scar, the scab. They take the scab and they put it um, into the incision and it makes a scar. All right, and then kind of the first, like, oh, this really cool example of modern vaccination right, was Edward Jenner. And what he noticed is the pus from cowpox, which is a closely related virus, would actually protect against smallpox, right? So a, a early example of, right, it doesn't necessarily have to be the exact same pathogen, right? It just has to be similar, 
in some cases, right? Again, it doesn't work in all cases. And the vaccine that we actually use for smallpox is not the actual smallpox virus. It's a closely related um, virus that infers protection. Yeah, cowpox. All right. Um, so this is a scar from modern vaccination. Uh, smallpox is the only virus um, that you use a bifurcated needle. Right, so it's basically, it looks like a little prong with two sharp edges. You dip it in the liquid, right? Surface tension holds it in, and then you just do like kind of a quick prick um, of the skin. One of the reasons that this was done uh, is to actually make vaccination uh, uh, more accessible in third world countries. This was just a lot easier um, delivery method than having to have a bunch of needles and syringes and all that stuff. Um, that's one of the reasons. And typically left a scar. So um, some of your parents may actually even have um, the scar. Uh, but again, we're not vaccinating for that on a wide scale anymore. You typically have to be um, military now to receive this vaccine or doing research on it. Um, they also receive the vaccine. So here are um, some of the different kind of categories. So you have variola major and variola minor. Both can cause um, smallpox, right? So here are other orthropox uh, viruses. So variola, right? This is what we call smallpox. Vaccinia, this is actually what we use to make our vaccine. And then you have cowpox and monkeypox. All right. Um, and the, the cowpox vaccine was actually one of the first widely distributed vaccines. It was pretty tricky at the time, though, because they didn't have great preservation methods. And so even though they knew it was protective, it was still kind of a hard vaccine to deliver. Oh, and if you also want to talk about ethics too. So Edward Jenner tested his vaccine on a little boy. And then I can't remember what the timeline was, but every few years he would purposefully try to infect the boy with smallpox to show, to show that he had immunity. So again, a right, little bit of different times. Um, so transmission can be airborne, right? So it's very contagious. Um, it's contagious at the start um, of the rash Right, and it's easily transmittable on fomites. If you remember, fomites are basically right objects that are not alive. Right, um, so you talk about bio warfare. Um, it was used. Uh, it's been used multiple times. Uh, the Russians tried it in World War II. Uh, used it against the indigenous tribes of Australia. We actually used it against our Native American population. So if you've heard of the Trail of Tears, right? Sometimes they purposely would make those large people groups move when it was cold. Right. Um, this caused a lot of death, regardless of disease, um, but um, there are documented instances where uh, American soldiers with smallpox, they gave them some blankets, right, that they rubbed all over themselves, that then gave those blankets to the Indians that were cold, all right, and that's how we spread smallpox amongst our indigenous populations, right, in the uh, 19th uh, century. So. so, again, smallpox has had kind of a, a previous history of bio warfare and um, you know just an example of our history right but if you look at the history of any country you see that there are a lot of things that we did um, that were uh, not uh, good and and hopefully we have moved uh, away from acts like that all right but smallpox has a history that yes sir oh that's a good question Holmes I am not um, sure yeah, I'd have to look, I'd have to look. That's a great question. Um, but this is an example um, of smallpox. Uh, there's a couple different stages. We're not gonna get uh, through all of this. We have an incubation um, period, right? You have something called a prodrome stage. Uh, the prodrome stage, uh, this is kind of challenging because the way you could describe the, this stage would be flu-like symptoms. Um, most diseases are very hard to diagnose because pretty much everything has listed flu-like symptoms right um, at the start. Uh, you then form macules, papules, vesicles, pustules, scrabs, and scars. And so here, these just kind of start to present as kind of like little red kind of lesions. And then basically those progress to the fluid-filled scars. Um, these, are the, these are the pustules, right? These eventually scab over and those scabs are highly contagious. But again, Holmes, yeah, I'm not sure if they're better um, at transmission uh, than 
um, it being aerosolized. And then these patients are often left with scars, right? And this is the same patient. You can see kind of how it progresses. And you can see that there can be severe physical deformity. So even those folks that survived smallpox, right, there's a lot of social, right, stigma that was associated um, uh, with the virus, right? So the thing that's interesting is that during that incubation period, the host doesn't actually cause infection, right? And this is different. Like, so something like uh, SARS-CoV-2, right, COVID-19, it's infectious during that incubation period, which makes it really challenging because, again, you could feel totally fine. You're in the incubation period and you're spreading to people. That's the case with um, smallpox, all right? So again, prodrome, right, flu-like symptoms, fever, headache, severe fatigue, back pain, vomiting. Again, nothing unique, all right? Um, the days following those flu-like symptoms, right, it's called the macular phase. So here are those flat red spots that appear on the face, uh, your extremities, and your trunk, right? They form macules. Um, an anthem, right? These are actually lesions that form in your mouth, right? The mucous membranes of your mouth um, and your nose, right? So it becomes highly contagious here, all right? Within a couple of days, right, these um, macules, right, start to fill with uh, fluid, all right? And then that fluid becomes pus, and you go from vesicles to pustules. So you can see, right, once you kind of hit this macule phase, progression is relatively quick, right? And if you go back and you look at this kid, right, I mean, look how fast that goes from day three to day seven, right, just a few days. Um, and it's advanced um, pretty good, all right? So then you have these scabs that form, again, highly contagious, and then you're left sometimes with these deep pitted scars. All right. Okay. Well, you guys can look through this. I'm not going to, there's not a ton that I can ask on smallpox. We didn't have a lot of time to talk about. I still think it's a really interesting presentation. So if you're just, you know, if you want to know, you can know, but here's different types of smallpox. Um, I'll just show you pictures quick and let you go. So this is ordinary smallpox, right? As those are the pitted, right, pustules that will become scars, right? Ordinary, but really dense. Here is flat type, right? So you can see it makes their skin kind of appear leathery. These uh, pox form kind of under that epidermal layer, very deadly. And this is hemorrhagic smallpox. And so you can see kind of like all these little black spots. That's from hemorrhaging from blood vessels uh, that are broken. Um, also incredibly, uh, incredibly fatal. All right. So I'll let you guys go. If you want to, you can look through the rest of this. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna test past the, uh, right here, the different, stages. Okay, but still cool stuff if you're interested in um, diseases. Uh, super interesting.